I've always known that you are very thoughtful and analytical about what you're doing. And it got me thinking about you as a kid and thinking, okay, and I can identify with this. I was funny in a very private way, quiet way, but not out loud to a lot of people. I always say I was not the class clown. Neither was I. Yeah. And Neither what were you I. like? I was, well, first off, I didn't go to the same school for more than two years until high school. Mm -hmm. So I just got bounced all over the city of Birmingham. So humor was the tool to kind of be, like if someone cracked on me or made a joke about me, I'd laugh it off. Sometimes I'd self-deprecate, yeah. tag, tag myself. Sure. Maybe jab you back, but just keep it peaceful. But I did not want a lot of attention on me because attention was bad. Like that was a, you're inviting the bullies. I think I read somewhere that once you used to talk to your hamster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guinea pig. Yeah, Joel. <laughs> yeah. You go into the room. Full blown and... conversation. <laughs> like, hey, I disagree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're actually oh, yeah, getting into it. response. Yeah, not like just you only understand me. Like, yeah, so what do you think? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, well, I'll, maybe I'll do that. Today they would medicate you. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> not realizing that that was the medication because sure. that was the outlet. I went outside. I played. I stayed out of trouble for the most part in the neighborhood. Uh, my mom got me a really nice basketball goal. There was a park up the street. I grew up on the west side. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a park on Pearson Avenue called Powderly Park. And that was the free public park with the courts. They me drinking and fighting. And it, like there was always something going on. So my mom, to keep me from going to Powderly all the time, she got me in the boys club. And then she also put a basketball goal in my yard. And the way our yard was set up, we had really high trees. So we had the only shaded driveway in peak 1 p.m. Alabama heat. So everybody would come from Powderly. Why play in direct sunlight when we can go play at Roy Wood's house? And so people would just come to, and it was out it's of respect. very smart of your mom to, to, to do that because it's, they say when you become a parent and then your kids, as mine are teenagers, everyone says you want your house to be the base. You want people coming over to your house because nice. it's safer. Yeah, yeah. And all you have to do is my mom. It's just listen for the dribble of the ball so you know I'm out there. Yeah. And so that became a way that I met everybody in the neighborhood. And out of respect to my father, my parents, all the riffraff that happened at Powderly never happened at our house. Just on some, you know, just on some respect your elders type shit. Yeah. I so, want to make sure I educate anyone who's listening that you mentioned your father, your father, Roy Wood Sr., was uh, a radio broadcasting journalism pioneer and also in the trenches of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Yeah. And you've said he was, if there's any march with Dr. King in it, your dad is a good chance. <laughs> three rows back. He's probably three <laughs> rows back. Um, and people in the neighborhood then knew that, obviously, and that respect probably emanated out from your father and your mother. A thousand percent. Gave you some, some sense of protection. My father was the voice in the car when their parents took them to school, mm -hmm. doing the news on the black radio station. So you can listen to all the black music you want in the morning, but when they stop for that news break on the fives, that's my pops. Yeah. So that, that got me a lot of equity within the city. But I wouldn't say that I was even remotely like on some funny sense of humor shit until high school. And even then it was only baseball because that was where you could be silly because it's sports. It's a permission, especially in high school. It's a sports is permission to behave in ways you're not allowed to at school. Hmm. So you tell all the crash jokes, you make fun of each other. Like, and then we would just as, as a bench warmer in high school, your job is to heckle the other team. Yeah. Just heckle them into oblivion. And I was good because that's all I had to do. So there were days where I would literally sit and write heckles in class. <laughs> to get ready for your game. To get ready for the game. <laughs> like, and uh -huh. just... That's great. Brutal shit, bro. Like stuff you couldn't even, places you yeah. couldn't even go with humor now, but just brutal and just yelling it across the diamond at a total stranger and seeing the look of frustration in their face. Like, I know I'm getting to you. 
And then to the point where if you got the if you got the parents to chuckle, like that was an applause break. If you got the umpire to call timeout because the umpire had to laugh, that's a standing ovation. <laughs> and that was the goal. The goal every game was to break the umpire. <laughs> But not uh, realizing that that was essentially just honing improv chops. Sure, yeah. And just working on crowd work. It's a crowd work. Set. Well, all this stuff, it's, uh, it's everyone has their own versions about it, uh, versions of it. But I know what you're talking about, which is, um, you know, we I come from a big family. So we all sit around this round table that's still at my parents' house. And I know exactly where I sat, and I know that that's where I tried to get the whole table laughing. I was in JROTC in high school, and when we would have to do drill um, some mornings, and we would start with running. They had like this quadruple tennis court, yeah. so we'd have to do laps around the whole perimeter of this yeah, tennis yeah. court. And as we're jogging, I'm calling the jog like a Kentucky Derby <laughs> And they're getting to turn two, turn two, and they're pulling even. It's Roy next to Monica. Monica coming up on the outside, coming up on the inside. It's Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major. It's coming in. <laughs> and, and you're supposed to be controlling your breath because you're running and I'm you're doing this bullshit. It doesn't matter. Like, um, Wood's falling short. Wood's falling short. But as they get into that, <laughs> like, that, was, that was who I was. Yeah. Just so we're laughing as we're running around the space. And that's when you start learning about comedy as this like tool of manipulation. Like yep. it's it's literally, I bet you I can make you detour from whatever your mental objectives are right now <laughs> by doing something. <laughs> it's like tickling yep. with your mouth. Yes, <laughs> you know I mean? yes, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm curious. Your father, this very revered figure, I think he passed away when you were pretty young. Yeah, you, 16. 16 years old. Would he have, what would he think of your career in, as a stand-up? Would he approve mm. of that of of that move? I don't think so. He would approve now based on the material that mm -hmm. I'm doing now. Right. But you also have to remember, my father like saw every horrible thing that you could name because he just had to cover it in the name of journalism. Yeah. Like foreign war reporting. So he saw like African civil wars, which are way worse in terms of body counts and the heinousness because a lot of that goes underreported, right? So he's seen stuff. So nothing's funny to him. And so case in point, when he worked at WVON in Chicago, my father was the first news director at this Black-owned black news station that mm -hmm. we are a news station that only does black news. Like if, like if the N in NPR stood for... <laughs> Say it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so they were dedicated to the black experience and uplifting black people. My father hires a guy named Don Cornelius. Oh yeah. Um, to be a DJ. He, Don Cornelius was a was a police officer in Chicago. He put my father over, gave him a ticket. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's where Don. Okay, Don's right. Don Cornelius's origin story. He was a member of law enforcement for about a year, maybe yeah. le less than two for sure. Pulls my dad over. In the course of giving my father a ticket, my dad just goes, "You have a nice voice. Here's yes. my card. <laughs> quit doing this shit. And come by the radio station." So Don Cornelius starts in radio under my father as a reporter at WVON. And during that time, as Don's understanding the media grows, he comes up with the idea for Soul Train, comes to my dad. My dad was one of the initial investors and gave Don some of the money that he used ultimately for the first pilot for Soul Train. And then when it came time to give my dad his money back, Don Cornelius goes to my father. and was like, hey, man, instead of me paying you back, why don't you just stay on board? You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, this, this is, I just want you to be a part of this. To which my dad told Don Cornelius, and I quote, motherfucker, nobody wants to watch niggas dance for an hour. <laughs> Give me my fucking money. <laughs> oh my God. So my dad just was not with 
party culture. Yeah. He was not Didn't, with fun. He just couldn't see well, it. Also, I mean, yeah, and you it's hard to blame him because of everything he saw and being in the trenches of the civil rights movement like that. And then some the dudes just going, what south. if we dance all day? <laughs> People have giant afros. Yes. He couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. That that celebration of blackness creates the black pride that helps to drive people wow. to want more for themselves, for yeah. their community. He couldn't see it. Uh, when I was in middle school, I was in a dunk tank for our soccer team to raise money for jerseys. And my dad came into the dunk tank and cussed me out and told me to get out the dunk tank in front of everybody. Like, get out of there. You're nobody's fool. You ain't gonna be nobody's fool. All this joking and shucking. Get that wow. lesson. I'm like, it's a dunk tank. We're raising money. It's just, I'm just gonna get splashed in some water. Yeah, yeah. we're raising money so we have decent uniforms because when you're a black middle school, you're only playing whites. This is soccer in 88. There's not a lot of black schools playing soccer. So we're playing all of the, our uniforms, bro, um, Ping, we had Ping, we borrowed jerseys from the, the Partners in Neighborhood Growth, which was like the Police Athletic League at the time in Birmingham. So you have a community league that has jerseys. We're borrowing their jerseys. That's how poor our school was. And then my dad is like, nah, get your ass up out of that. And it was very embarrassing. And I just remember after that, I just never tried to be funny around him again. Yeah. Because just you're not with jokes, bro. He was a lot of things. He was not hilarious. <laughs> <laughs>